It's time to act now. Will you do it? Or do I need to awaken the ancient one myself? No. Please, Rob. I've longed to do this for hundreds of years. Then what are you waiting for, my brethren? Go. Bring them all to their graves and let them reach the grass beneath them quicker than they can take their final breath. But what should I do with the newcomers? They tread through the fire as if they wore a garment of ice. Shh. I understand that they will be a nuisance for the time being. The dreamers come from their rifts in his name to search for an artifact of great power. One you know of quite well, I presume. Unfortunately, I can stay no longer to guide you. My spirit drifts towards the astral sea as we speak. The rest of my plan rests with you, my fallen prince. <laughs> it will be done, brother mine. The Dreams Arc 3 returned to its roots. As our heroes turned their gaze from where Rob had vanished from, they were greeted with a familiar sight. The colossal form of Teasting Voltrigen, the mechanized dragon that swallowed the Tower of Lander whole, plummeted into the Biestge Bay, creating a massive tsunami 120 feet tall rocketing towards them at an amazing speed. Within the minute it took for the enormous wave to hit the party's location, Demetra crafted a ball of plants surrounding the group in order to protect them from the crushing impact of the tidal wave. They surged forward, and soon the plant's integrity failed, and the orb of living matter soon started to fill with water. Jack Handsome cut a hole in the ceiling with his great sword helped everyone escape the watery trap. Demetra then attempted to have everyone try, and steered the plant ball by running across the top of it to increase its momentum. As the wave subsided to nothing, they found themselves only a few miles north of Gahirst. They saw that there was no way to get across the mile-wide gap that spanned the continent, so they called upon their ally, Takaya, the ancient bronze dragon, to help them get across this impassable obstacle. Before she arrived, Demetra sent a letter to an old friend to meet her at the docks of Sartara, with an army, since they would need as many men as they could muster. A strange fellow by the name of Geoffrey stumbled upon them in the woods, claiming to be lost, and was on his way to the grand capital. However, he had no way to get across the ravine and asked if they could help them. They begrudgingly obliged, after debating to kill him immediately or not. Takaya soon arrived after and offered to help them in return for knowledge of something she did not already know. When discussed, Adam asked his spirit guide for help. The spirit bear provided a scroll that contained the Krabby Patty's secret formula. And Takaya gladly accepted the small parchment, however, asking that they swear upon Demetra's life that the few that betrayed them in the Guild War 
would not fall out of line again, and would not follow the darkness. They agreed, and soon soared through the clouds on the back of their companion towards the Grand Capital. They arrived and requested an audience with the current leader of Zarethkistead, General Stilu. Upon entering her courtroom, they asked for a location of any magical items that she may have knowledge of, and if she could provide any assistance to aid them retrieve the objects. She told them that there was a supply cache of magical items and weapons where they had just come from, in Gehirst. Shasivan and Geoffrey became married once entering a very strange pocket dimension. With the help of five extra guards and Geoffrey, they made their way back to Takaya to travel to the south. They arrived just outside of Gehirst and surrounded the camp stealthily. Once in place, they charged up the mounds and very quickly slaughtered all the hobgoblins that were within the camp. Even when surprised by a hobgoblin giant that erupted out of the ground. Those hobgoblins being the last of their kind, the party had now eradicated a once great evil that ravaged the lands in the days of old. In the rubble, they found weapons and items of great magical power. Geoffrey found a magnificently carved onyx, ruby, and gold staff that measured eight feet in length, with a spinning orb in the middle of a crescent residing at the top. The party returned to Takaya and ventured to the continent's home of necromancy. Ipolivain. They met with the leading mage in necromancy who went by the name of Novak. He informed the party that there was very little they could do to bring back Tyrion unless they could require an ancient artifact. It was mentioned very briefly in an ancient text. Its name? The Staff of Octio Torirth. They asked Joffrey to show Novak the staff to see if it was the same one, which it was indeed. He said that that was the hard part. The next step was finding and killing Rob, being as close to him as they could with the staff and then taking Tyrion's soul when it came out of Rob's body. They would have to take the soul to Tyrion's body in the World Tree as quickly as they could. Unfortunately, he did not know how long the soul would stay attuned to the staff, so they would have to make it as quick as they could. Adam and Isgand went in search for a tavern to drink at. However, the only one they could find was abandoned. They searched the tavern and found a small cask of ale that seemed to shimmer in and out of existence. When Isgand consumed even just a taste of it, he was immediately knocked unconscious. Adam hoisted him onto his back and grabbed the cask as well, for they might need it in the coming future. The party returned to Kaya to return to Zarethkistead, but Nefiria decided they needed to make a detour. When they arrived in the perpetual autumn forest in the north, at Orkale Tower, they met a young half-orc bard by the name of Asparagus, one of the heroes of old and an old friend of Nefiria. He made acquaintances with the rest of the party and they asked him if they would join them to fight and defeat Rob. He agreed, of course, and they set their course towards the capital. Once returning to General Stilu with the information they had received, they asked for any men she could spare. She was able to provide a few thousand, but asked the party to locate Rob before she allowed any of her men to go with them. The party attempted to locate Rob with the help of Takaya and Adam's spirit bear. Takaya did not know any whereabouts of Rob, but the spirit bear was able to provide vague but important information. Flower 
tree end. The party could assume enough that Rob was on his way to Silda to bring the Saren flower to the world tree, and somehow, some way, there would be an end. They thanked Stilu for her help, and the party spent the night restlessly deciding what they should do before they took action. They finished planning what they would attempt to do to protect the city and how they would help protect the citizens of Silda. Ilden, Jack, Shasivan, and Asparagus spent the rest of the evening resting, while Demetra, Isgand, Adam, Nefiria, and Geoffrey went to Satara, on Takaya to meet with Tyrius and his hopefully requested army. After some very awkward silence, between Demetra and Tyrius, Isgand offered to help settle the agreements and filled in Tyrius with the preparations they had made just hours ago. After some very offensive language from Tyrius towards Demetra, some words of surprising wisdom from Adam, and strong pleas from Isgand, he finally agreed to join them, with 3,000 men at his disposal. After their negotiations, he requested to talk to Demetra alone. When the group obliged, he started asking Demetra about their past together. Why had she gone mad and killed those people? There was no need for the violence. And after some debating, he described how the humans were ambushed and mostly slaughtered. How he watched his wife and kids tortured and killed in front of him by the elves he was trying to so desperately free his people from. Demetra said some words and then kissed him, trying to win him back, for she truly loved him and did all those things for him. He pushed her away and told her that she couldn't win him over that easily, and told her that she needed to prove that she could redeem herself before he could give her a second chance, walking off towards the now rising sun their fate awaiting them all. Awakening the next morning with the party reunited, Ilden, Jack, Shasivan, and Nefiria all journeyed to Silda on Tikaya. As they passed over the Whispering Forest, they saw the garb that they knew all too well, the bright red and black garbs that belonged to Rob. They arrived in Silda three days ahead of Rob, and prepared the city the best they could, preparing fortifications, barriers, trenches, and helping as many of the citizens that wouldn't join their aid to a safe place outside of the city, and whoever was left towards the back of the city walls. As they prepared for the coming battle, all they could hope was that Rob was weakened from the last time they fought him. When the time came, each of the party members stood upon the highest parapet overlooking the main gate and gave rousing speeches to bolster the spirits of their armies, inspiring their will to protect the world tree at all costs. As a group of seven individuals came marching out of the darkness, Rob was nowhere to be seen among their ranks, as each member of the party readied their ghost beer covered weapons. Shasivan saw Rob hiding amongst the army's ranks. He attempted to get past the wall, but as soon as Rob climbed the walls, he was shot by one of Demetra's bullets, covered in ghost beer, putting Rob to sleep instantly. Isgen stayed to fight until all of Rob's friends were dead, at the cost of almost losing his own life. One of the party members grabbed Rob and started to run back to the world tree hoping to kill him as close to it as they could in order to be close to Tyrion. As they approached within 100 meters of the world tree, Rob awakened and started to run towards the tree. Before he could get close, Jack cast a spell that would revive Rob after he was killed so they could get him as close to the tree as they could. The party managed to deal a significant amount of damage to him, only 
enraging him. With a mighty roar, he seemed to grow four times his height and started to move towards the tree. With each barrage of attacks against Rob, he grew into a more terrifying creature of unnatural proportions, growing extra arms, and soon had three heads which it directed magic through. Luckily, Demetrius shot a powerful round into Rob's hand, making him drop the sarin flower he was holding. Shasivan cast a spell that made Rob shrink to half his size. Ilden became invisible with the help from Jack and managed to grab the flower and get it out of range of Rob. Adam threw Elden at Rob's gargantuan form and stabbed him with her dual katanas. And Ysgand, almost laying down his life again, managed to kill Rob the first time and bring him to his knees directly in front of the world tree. As Rob regained consciousness due to Jack's spell, Rob saw a familiar sight as Jack once again, grinning, stood over him, readying his horns to deal the final blow. He charged at Rob with a force so mighty and a cry so powerful that it shook the ground around them as Jack's horns impacted with Rob's eyes the light slowly seeping out from the three heads. He then proceeded to hit the heads into the stratosphere, never to be seen again, and leaving the party rejoicing. However, their work was not complete. As the staff Jack carried came into close proximity of Rob's corpse, two orbs floated out of his chest and started to attack one another, one being a blood red, and the other being a fading blue. Jack quickly attuned the blue orb to the staff, hoping that it was Tyrion's soul, and burst through one of the four doors in the world tree, running as fast as he could towards his friend's body of stone. When he reached his friend, he held the staff over the body of Tyrion. The orb soon started to drift out of the staff and danced around as if it was happy to be reunited with its vessel, and soon flew itself into the stone chest of Tyrion. After a few moments of silence, a blinding wet light shot out from his chest, and the stone around his body slowly turned to flesh, revitalizing him. He hopped off of his resting place and hugged his companion, excited to finally walk and breathe fresh air again. As the group was walking back to the city gates to see what was left of their army, Ilden found the Sarin flower and picked it up, hoping to do something with it. However, as soon as she placed it in her pocket, it seemed to crumble to ashes. One by one, each of the party members and all of their companions were overtaken by a magical slumber, seeming to never awaken. As they slept, they heard faint whispers of what remained of Rob's soul, asking for aid from another being of possibly great power, before his soul drifted off into oblivion. When each of them awoke, they appeared to be separated from each other, each returned to where they seemed to be most connected to. Elden, Shasivan, Jack, and Tyrion awaking at the newly reconstructed Tower of Lander, Nefiria and Ordis awakening at their home in Silda, Iskand awakening in his guild hall in the grand capital of Zarethkistead, and Adam, Mieg, Tyrius, and Demetra awakening on Demetra and Tyrius' home island. Many things have changed during the past century, some for the better, others possibly for the worst. The party now thousands of miles apart from each other must take some time to acclimate to their new surroundings and learn what they can, for they will need to find a way to regroup, possibly the most daunting of their tasks to come. <laughs>